Yeah. All right. I'm we're ready beginning. to record so, right now. Okay, good. I'm and I'm also ready and we're running and we're pressing record and no You're one ready. owns me. Wait, don't wait, don't don't press record yet. What? Paul, <laughs> this is your choice, so you introduce this time, please. Well, let's oh, yes. welcome okay. everybody to the podcast. That's, Spine that's what I mean. Spine crackers. I want Paul to do it. All right. This is a spine pack crack. <laughs> <laughs> spine crackers podcast with paul matt and gabe and uh like the the great charles dickens once said crack that spine have a good time <laughs> oh. that's, a, that's a that's a quote from one of his books if you haven't he, thought it it's true is that's that right or are you playing a trick no it's real you can read all of his books and you'll understand oh uh, <laughs> That was the, not a flex. It's, the joy. It's not a real quote. It's not a real quote. Come on, but it's it's funny to me. So Paul likes uh, to snap open his cans and then also previously before we were recording, f- flaunt his his cash money yeah. at the screen. Only fifty. My notes, dude. Yeah. Only fifty. So, and only three of them. Still, <laughs> it's more than I have. Yeah. Uh. Yeah. Yeah. I don't have that much money. I have zero. Um, <laughs> If you get paid in cash, it means that you probably don't have the best job. Let's just p- leave it at that, right? Uh, right? Not necessarily. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I I'm just like, waiting tables that I do as a like in a lot of other jobs that I've done. Yeah, that's okay. It yeah. just depends on what your hustle is. Basically, long story short, get up, grind, get this bread. Yeah. Period, baby fucking yeah work yeah work 60 hours a week put your head down carry on work 60 hours get paid cash i mm-hmm. think that, i think that's also dickens yeah, yeah. R- rise and grind is dickens oliver uh, Twist definitely rose and ground he yes. did i mean a lot of these characters can be said to have risen in ground and gotten theirs sort uh, of like the character of F. F. scott fitzgerald indeed <laughs> Indeed. Yeah. He rose in ground. He wrote a book for uh because he wanted uh, to have sex and it worked. And they got married and had a mutually destructive alcoholic death spiral of a relationship, but yeah. he can't be said to have not gotten what he wanted. Sad. <laughs> oh no. Sad. Oh, that's right. Uh we never said that we were uh talking about Moon Palace today. I don't think. We didn't. We are talking about Moon Palace. We haven't even really started the podcast yet. <laughs> we did. We are. We are starting it. We, we did start it officially. We we've been doing it. We should say. We should also say we're recording this currently. There's there's no president of the United States. It's yeah. it's a lawless, uh, uh, wild land out there. Yeah, I think legally you're. It's just you know you just do whatever. Legally, the president is is the physical constitution right now <laughs> yes it's jan it's J- it's jan hancock and uh george washington and if you can whoever has it is the reigning in the interim the reigning president it's ba- it's like the conch so, from fucking from fucking uh lord of the flies, flies. yeah that's exactly right you talk through you roll it up as a tube <laughs> and you yell you yell at people and they have to do what you tell them <laughs> Well, so we're we're doing purge. That's what I'm thinking. Of. Yeah, we uh this the book this week was my pick. It was Moon Palace by Paul Auster, and I picked it because Paul Auster has the same first name as me. And that was basically <laughs> it. Um, <laughs> hey. No, I picked it because I I had read two books prior. I I read the the New York trilogy, which Gabe you have also read, and you liked it a lot. I did like. And it. I also read, I read the Book of Illusions by Paul Auster, which I also liked a lot and i was i haven't read a book of his in like maybe five years um so i was excited to read another one and moon palace was written in 1989 i think i think it was one of his earlier novels paul oster and paul (laughs) oster is like a uh a new york based author he's very new york yes i actually i actually really like him as a person I, i listen to a lot of interviews 
and I have over the years, and I, I always thought he was just like a cool dude. Um, but Gabe, do you want to give the synopsis? Because I don't want to do that. Uh, yeah, I could. I can. I can give it a shot. Um, so basically, it's it's a it's a weird structure because a lot of it is just stories of a, a huge chunk of the book is stories of past things that have happened to the characters. Um, like, so there's a, there's a, um, it's told by, by the main character who's named is Marco Stanley Fogg. Uh, yeah. MS. MS. Fogg. It was by MS. Um, and uh, it's sort of a, a sort of life and times um, work. Uh, it takes place in the sort of, like what, like late 60s, 70s? Yeah, but like, I, I, for, I don't yeah, know what like, the span of yeah. time is, really. Yeah, I don't know what the, the exact span is, but it's like vaguely Woodstock, Vietnam. Uh, 68 to 72, but like, I think, but like, or something like that. Or no, it's it starts with the moon landing, essentially. Yes. So what's that? Which 60, is 68? Mm. Man, I'm 69? stupid. I don't hey, it's know. not a history podcast, people. That's true. 31? I think it's 1931. <laughs> uh, 1969, July 20th. Nice. <laughs> the I said that. I said that. Nice, dude. You got so anyway, it. Nice. So, the, so the book follows uh, Fog. We get a little bit of background with his family. Um, he never knew his father, uh, and his mother dies relatively young. She's hit by a bus. He then um, is taken in with, by his uncle, Victor, who's a sort of um, kind of vagabondish musician. He teaches the clarinets, is that right? Yes. Yes. Um, and uh, uh, lives with him for a while. He then goes off to college at Columbia um, in New York City, uh, gets an apartment. Victor dies and um, Marco starts to sort of slowly spiral into this bizarre kind of existence where he's reading all of the books that Victor left him and slowly donating them or selling them and then only living off of that money and, and sort of living this uh, uh, monkish existence in his apartment and effectively at one point uh, gives himself up to like inevitable death and starvation uh, yeah. which he you which is sort of a theme he does that a couple times it seems <laughs> yeah. uh, he then has a sort of chance encounter um in with uh, a, a group of young people who feed him and he gets a sort of second lease on life um briefly but ultimately he's still evicted from his apartment he then goes and lives in Central Park for a time as a sort of, you know, as a homeless person. Um, and uh, eating, out of, eating out of trash bags or trash, trash cans as receptacles. Mm -hmm. um, yes. Ultimately, he, he uh, links back up with um, the girl that he met and uh, her name's Kitty, Kitty Wu. Yeah. And he gets a job sort of sort of sort of by chance um as basically the not caretaker but sort of paid companion of this eccentric rich old guy who's maybe blind um paralyzed in a wheelchair and uh, this very sort of eccentric enigmatic rich old guy and he uh, ultimately, so it starts out, he, so he sort of reads him the news, reads him books, whatever he wants to hear. But ultimately he starts to sort of dictate this guy's biography as he says, speaks it to him. Um, and I, I, won't, I won't go into all the details of that now, we can come back to it. I, I don't think it's, you know, but it's, it's a very wide ranging, bizarre life story that this guy had, which also includes a number of episodes of living in a similarly sort of destitute homeless state to what Marco had just done in the park. Um, and so we can, we can come back to the details of that later. Ultimately, um, uh, the old guy whose name is Thomas Effing. Right, which is a, yeah, well, yeah, whatever. But yeah, go ahead. 
it's a nom de plume or something, right? It's a self-anointed name. Right, right. It's not his real name. Um, yeah, it's a Jim Appel. Right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so then, um, Effing ultimately dies, um, sort of, sort of by his own choice, by his own design. Um, and again, we can talk about that. Uh, then Marco um, gets a bunch of inherits. He leaves Marco a, a large sum of money, which him and Kitty then live off of for a time. He, um, you know, is just sort of reading and writing and blah, 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 finishing school. And then, um, I, let me make sure if I'm not missing anything like big in between there. Essentially, I don't think so. Yeah, essentially. No, it sounds good. I mean, I think. Essentially, that after that, Kitty, Kitty gets pregnant. They have a, a, a big sort of falling out over it. They end their relationship. And um, Marco goes on a sort of cross-country trip and winds up at the Pacific Ocean sort of contemplating where to take the rest of his life. Right. And are we are we, well, are I think, we, are I we think over that, uh, oh, sorry. I was just going to say, like, I thought that if I were, if I were to, summarize it i would probably bring it into three different sections and the last section would be uh ms's dad it would be like you know the, the oh, yeah, initial no. story of of ms then effing and then the last section i would probably give to ms's dad i forget his name Sa sal well my question was going to be did we want to mention that or save it is are we trying to be coy about any of this stuff or are we just sort of I, giving... I, I, I wasn't no. i honestly just forgot that part a little bit yeah um, solomon solomon barber solomon barber yeah, yeah. barber who was effing yeah, son uh who also turns out to be ms's dad yes so he... but i mean I, I think i would i would basically summarize fat. it as like ms's like weird journey of being homeless and becoming skinny and being like a very depressed individual <laughs> and and then he then he meets effing and that's probably like the two-thirds of the book and the last three quarters would be the story of barber and more in depth about the story of ms and and kitty yeah you know and that's kind I, of where it ends you know what i i thought of while reading this was um uh the it was a uh, cloud atlas just I, for I the never read it just for the like what felt like a kind of nesting doll structure uh that has that where the nests are at different time periods mm. so like you start in the far future you sink back into the farthest reaches of the past and you resurface into the present or the far future in terms of cloud atlas but See, what i was thinking of most of all was when george lucas said it's like poetry it rhymes <laughs> oh my god that i <laughs> <laughs> I'm not. I'm not even kidding. I was that's actually a, thinking about that a lot. That's real. Like, yeah, yeah it's totally real. Yeah, and that's the, actually like a. That's a really similar vibe that uh, Paul Oster does in most of his novels. <laughs> explain, please let's explain like a little bit more. I don't get it. I, I'm just saying that, like, you know, there, there's a lot of, uh, like, a story will happen. And then another character will come into place and they'll have like a similar story. And you'll be like, how does that relate to this last story? And then another story will come in and it'd be like, oh, that relates to this and this. And it's like, there's all these interconnections happening. So and it's kind of like, happened. is it like, um, what is it, 300? When Leonidas says, <laughs> <laughs> the things we do today will echo in eternity? Yes. No. Exactly like that. And so, but, but I mean, I get, I take your point, Paul, there are a lot of sort of resonances and repeated themes and even like periods and, and periods and events that occur across all three. Essentially what we, what we wind up talking about is three generations of the same family, right? So Marco, and then his yeah. father turns out to be Solomon Barber, who was a college professor who um, was disgraced when he had sex with the woman who turns out to be um, Marco's mother and um, then sort of goes around the country teaching for brief periods at different colleges and then ultimately uh, um, is tracked down by Marco once Thomas Effing dies because Thomas Effing was Solomon Barber's father. 
And so we, it's, it's essentially a sort of three generational story about these, these three men. But Paul, my question well, that's is. That's also not. Oh, go ahead. Well, my, well, I just want to ask you, were you talking more about Paul Oster? Because both of you have read. I This is my first Paul Oster book. I've not read anything else by him. Were you suggesting that like this is something he does in all the other books kind of that you've read as well? Yes, he definitely does this. He it's like uh like in in the New York trilogy there's actually a character named Paul Oster in the New York trilogy. And I think he he likes to play with uh with any identity of any character. He he likes to divulge in some sort of area of like how how true is this what like what if you're reading this like how much of it is true how much of it is like just an exploration of any character or any like characterization i don't know like i can't really explain myself which is he being be meta honest, but... basically like is that like him yes yes there's a lot of meta aspects to Paul Oster's writing. Where it's like these characters Unless, are like just ciphers interchangeably put into even different time periods where like similar things happen. And like maybe that's part of his statement about writing or something. I don't know. Possibly. It's been a, it's been a long time since I read the New York trilogy. I've read it twice. But there are... The, these sort of like overlapping themes that he likes to pronounce on every single one of his characters that are just like it it, it leads to a a, a, st- a status of just being confused and just being like how much of this is true how much of this is just like an overabundance of a certain theme there are definitely questions um, of, of reliability at play here specifically in the effing in the thomas effing section where yeah uh he's dictating his his life and you know even even from the details about him being being blind uh marco never is even really he's never sure exactly how true anything that effing is telling him is or even how true any aspect of effing's personality or or even like physical state really is <laughs> right um uh, other yeah. than he's paralyzed well like <clears throat> This felt very much, I thought, like overall book about writing. I don't. How old? Again, this is a question I'll have often. But like, how old is Paul Oster at this point? Does it is have an idea? Maybe, maybe mid, late seventies. Or how old was he in nineteen eighty nine? Rather. Oh, probably like late thirties, early forties. I'm guessing. Does that or just... like maybe mid thirties? I mean, we could clear this up, but. Um, yeah, let's Again, it, it it feels like and it feels very much like one of those works that I I, I feel like maybe it's like uh, the second or third book in a person's sort of writing career where it's them tackling tackling the difficulty of writing itself and start writing about writing essentially. I, I feel like that happens often, um, especially well, he, because he does that. Hmm. He does that throughout his career, though. Like I think a lot of his writing process like a lot of his novels kind of go into the mind of a writer. Um, so I, I don't think he really, I think that the the New York trilogy and the book of illusions, which is the two books I've read, I did like more than this. So I feel like he did evolve in certain ways, but I, I don't think he actually. New York trilogy was before this. What was it really? Yeah. 87. Ooh. Well, wow, I'm a fucking, I'm a fucking new. Oh my God. Interesting. I always took him to be a more of like a, a I don't know, Graham Greene or, or a mystery writer type of guy. This mm. is why this was my notion of him until just now That's when I read this book, because uh, he would get tra- trotted out with, you know, the 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 litany of, of super New York based writers at the time. I remember I was aware and interested in, in possibly reading something of his in college where at the same time as like Jonathan Latham and uh uh fuck the why well, can't I remember his name not michael chabin but some you know I, I, like these people were popping off and he was kind of like in the same breath of these people right he was 42 when he wrote this book yep 42 
and he didn't from what i understand from listening to, to some interviews he he like wrote a lot when in his 20s but didn't get published until his early 30s he kind of he wrote a lot of manuscripts that he just like gave up on and i don't know when his first book was published but he was in his 30s so this is a relatively early on novel of his Kind but of. not not nowhere near he's been writing he's been trying to break in for a while yeah i guess i just see i see i saw a lot of like layers to this I, the the nesting technique kind of lost me a bit occasionally but i think there was an early statement when he's kind of like homeless and rambling and, and shambolic and like walking through central park and probably feverish at that point or whatever where I I don't know what to make of of the fact that he basically lived inside of a, a an inherited apartment, and all the furniture was made out of books stacked in different ways, <laughs> which I thought was actually really cool. Yeah, it was really cool. So so the so Victor, his uncle who dies, or he's not dead at this point, but he he is going on a tour with his new jazz band, and he can't he can't bring his his collection of books, and he leaves them to Marco. And they arrive at his apartment one day in these these you know dozens and dozens of of boxes, and Marco effectively uses them to create the <laughs> furniture for the apartment. And after you know, and after Victor is, sort of dies, and as Marco's going through these books, um, and has sort of decided to uh, uh, you know give up on life essentially. The furniture, he talks about how the furniture is going away. It's literally like wasting away in front of him as he's reading through these books and selling them. But what is he going to, is he going to school for fucking literature as well? Like what, what is he going to Columbia for? And why does he make the choice to retreat into the apartment and just live there and not engage with anybody? I, I think I didn't like, uh, Victor dies. I didn't like this Victor guy. Victor died. I don't like Mark. I liked him. I liked Marco. I, no. I, I didn't like him as like fundamentally I didn't like him, but I, I was really connected with him as a human. Like it wasn't in a good way. I was every every aspect of his character, I was like, I don't like anything you're doing. I think you're you're full of ghosts and you're full of spooks and you're weak <laughs> and you're a fucking hufflepuff. But <laughs> Whoa, save I, that for later. Spoilers, dude. <laughs> I'm, I'm, go I'm 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 gonna I'm gonna save it for later, but I have to admit that even though I didn't like him, I connected with him on so many levels. I thought that like he was really relatable to me, especially being in his early twenties. Like I think the book ends and he's like twenty four years old. Yep, he's in his mid twenties. Like, yeah. That's true. That's something to keep in mind. Is he's super young? Yeah it it feels like like when it got to the end and he was, I realized he was only twenty four. I thought I felt like he should have been older because the book felt kind of long. And I I thought that a lot a lot more time had passed, but he's only twenty four. Can I read a, and... a passage that I felt called out by as a nineteen year old? Please, yes. With all the fervor and idealism of a young man who had thought too much and read too many books, I decided that the thing I should do was nothing. My action would consist of a militant refusal to take any action at all. This was nihilism raised to the level of an aesthetic proposition. <laughs> I would turn my life into a work of art, sacrificing myself to such exquisite paradoxes that every breath I took would teach me how to savor my own doom. <laughs> I literally, Matt, I literally wrote that line down in my notes as one to read. Yeah. I mean, God fucking yeah. damn it. I was like, fuck. Okay. That, that's, I, th yeah. I, I highlighted that one as well. That was, a, <laughs> that was the, that was the beginning of his choice to obviously just like, like he calculates his finances and he's like, I can live on this amount of money for this long, but I'm not, I'm going to choose not to work. I'm going to keep going to school and just fast and like eat one meal a day and like do nothing. And then right. that evolves, that divulges into like, all right, once I run out of money, I'm just going to eat out of trash bins. And I actually, like, my favorite chapter was probably the first chapter. It was a long chapter. There's a couple of really long chapters that um i think they give like the most information and then there's like little sub chapters afterwards like they do that in the first chapter with ms and then like with effing and then with uh barber too but 
I don't know. Like the first chapter was what I like about Paul Oster the most is that like he has this amazing ability to get into the mind of someone who's like absolutely insane and like wants to be homeless and like is just living at at this really base level of living and that happens in the New York trilogy too and that's like almost what I love most about his writing I don't know how he does it but the little details in that chapter were so like I just loved him I I love the little details of like oh I I realized that this bush was safe to be in at night and I realized that like if I added these trash bins people would look at me but after a while I like I learned to just shake off their looks. Um, Can I read it? I don't know. I thought I thought it was great. I think um, this is a this is a passage that I think touches on a few of these things uh, in terms of being in this 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 guy's mind as he sort of declines and then is and then is pulled back. He describes like being pulled back from falling off a cliff by his friends, and and that that sort of yo-yoing happens a couple of times, not only to him but to um effing in his retelling of the story and then in his actual life and then barber also later um there's a there's a theme with all of these three men of sort of being constantly on the edge of just giving in to to, to death and suicidal sort of ideations and well, but it's never they all in certain ways commit types of long form slow suicide right it seems like a heritable trait because they're all related Right. Yeah. So, so, you know, um, Barber is of course, like the big thing about him is that he's like, like e extraordinarily fat and it's talked about as him sort of just, you know, in, even in his own mind, eating himself to death and just kind of retreating into this fortress of his own body um, mm -hmm. after his, his uh, disgrace with having sex with his student. Um and effing, of course, essentially commits suicide by, he's a very old sort of frail guy and he insists on going out in the rain one night and gets sick and, and then dies that way. Um, and then uh, uh, Marco, you know, it's sort of trying to starve himself to death multiple times, basically. But this is, um, <laughs> so this is on, on, it's on the PDF, it's on page 67. Um, so this is for context, he's been homeless for a little while living in Central Park and he's seeking refuge from a, a, a rainstorm that had happened the night before. And he's trying to sort of recover from that. Um, so it says he's, he's just tried to dry his hair on like a, a, a blow dryer in a bathroom. To my horror, the gusts of hot air puffed up my hair into a ridiculous angle. And I wound up looking like a gargoyle, a crazed figure jutting from the bell tower of some Gothic cathedral. Desperate to undo the mess, I impulsively loaded my razor with a fresh blade, the last one in my knapsack and started hacking off my wild serpent locks. By the time I was, I'm, I'm getting Britney Spears vibes here already. <laughs> By the time I was finished, my hair was so short that I scarcely recognized myself anymore. It accentuated my thinness to an almost appalling degree. My ears stuck out, my Adam's apple bulged, my head seemed no bigger than a child's. I'm starting to shrink, I said to myself, and suddenly I heard myself talking out loud to the face in the mirror. Quote, don't be afraid, my voice said. No one is allowed to die more than once. The comedy will be over soon and you'll never have to go through it again. And I think it's funny because the, one of these, one of the things that the, the sort of theme that I was pointing out is that these people all effectively do die multiple times. Effing, Thomas Effing literally at one point fakes his own death and um, it goes and hides out in the wilderness. Uh, and so he literally dies a, a couple times. And so I thought that it was just sort of an interesting commentary on one of the running themes in the book, which is these brushes with suicide and brushes with death that these characters all experience multiple times. It's also very jokerified. Yeah, and I think that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I I think that like, like I said before, like the 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 common theme or common thread that these characters all kind of experience the same thing, or like a similar experience in a in a way, but might be slightly different. That's that's the Paul Oster trope. Um, I will say that even though all their experiences were, were very similar, their characterization and their motives were also very different 
than each right. from each other. Like I, I thought that M, I thought that MS's reasoning for doing this like self-imposed uh, homelessness was because of traumatic experience. Like he, 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 he was basically. He he was in trauma. Like he, he lost his mom. He had he didn't know who his dad was, and then he lost he loses his uncle Victor, who was he was closest to, and it sets him off into the deep end. With uh with Barber, it's it's a lot different, and I I like his reasoning a lot more for for becoming like fatter than ever. Like <laughs> he's super fat, and then he uh. I mean, it's later re revealed that Barber is the son of MS, and what happened was he was MS a teacher is the at son a... of Barber. Yeah, sorry. So what what's later revealed is that Barber had an affair with his, and which is MS's mom when she was nineteen, a student at the college he was working at, and he was like in his thirties or something, and he gets fired. Um. And then he. Uh, just like eats more and more. I think at that point he was like 250 pounds. But I, I love the progression from like, I care about being this fat. I care about what people think of me to suddenly he takes this turn of like, I don't care anymore. I'm And then I'm going, I'm going bald or I'm going to shave my head. And I'm going to wear hats now. He's Jokerfied as well. He, he like he's Jokerfied. Well, he's not Jokerfied. I don't think he's Jokerfied. I think he's, he's wearing a trill. I think he's. I think he's sternerified. I think he's pretty sterner in his fatness. I don't know about that, my man. <laughs> I, I, I don't I think he is. I, I don't know. I think he, I think he is. Don't think we should debate the the nuances of Sterner's philosophy on this topic. But he's he's not. He's it's, very spooked. He's it is too spooked. bad. It's too. Yeah. What? It's too bad that we 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 can't debate Sterner philosophy because I I was thinking about Sterner throughout this book. Well, I mean, it's, fine, it's a great, ex yeah, yeah. It's a great example of of people who are like, it's it, it's a great example of like notionally being free in some other direction that is deeply destructive and not in line at all with I would say what what Max Turner is ever talking about. It, you know, well, I I I think there's a big there's a big like shadow over the whole book and all the characters of something very religious. Like there's a lot of religious implications, like and shame and guilt. That's very religious based. I don't know if you guys picked up on that, but every time it came up, I was like, wow, this person like MS in particular is very conscious of some sort of religious action and religious thought because he's constantly like shameful of his actions and con constantly just like like guilt ridden well and, and I think that especially there's you know especially early on when he's going sort of yo-yoing between this homeless sort of sort of self you know monk it, it really is a sort of self-denial ideology of self-denial and then he sort of you know he there's a paragraph that i i didn't know i didn't write down or i didn't note but there's a section where he talks about you know, he's essentially, I'm going to overcorrect in the other direction. It was all about me before. And I was very sort of thinking about myself and everything was internalized. And now I'm, I'm, I'm only going to be for other people. I'm only going to be altruistic and I'm going to be help, help people all the time. So I do definitely think Paul, that you're, you're right, that he has this sort of um, sense of, of an external sort of order or, or, or uh, judgment that he needs to be aware of. And I mean, it it may be relevant to, to this that he explicitly has um, anti-abortion sentiments that he talks about sort of yeah. towards the end. Yeah. When he gets exactly. Killed. Yeah. Uh, Matt, did you get any of this at all? Yeah. Well, I was about to say his his like trenchant pro-life stance at the end. I guess kind of didn't seem in line with his character when I was reading it at, initially, but framed hmm. overall i can see that that was always a possibility and he and he does seem almost detached from his own vehemence that an abortion should never happen at least like of his own child uh in a way where he 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 seems like an automaton for this 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 notion almost like he's not in control he's 
he's just like the more I try and the more I sort of intellectually understand that I should be <laughs> a little bit more lenient or comforting to my girlfriend or and whatnot, the the more entrenched and and dug in I get about this and angry and stuff. So that yeah, that was the first time a, it ever felt like an explicitly a, an idea tied so closely to religion. So and for me, that was head. like. Within the context for me, that was like the oh sorry, go ahead, Gabe. Um, you know, within the context of the story, his position on that question is explained by the fact that he was a sort of child of this problem, you know, socially problematic, you know, sort of um, birth. Where his mother, he was, you know, essentially a bastard child of a single mother whose father conceived him in a disgraceful way, and a lot of social pressure would have been put on his mother to possibly have an abortion. And she came close, I think it comes up once or twice. And so he sort of, you know, sees his own life as the product of someone, you know, choosing to not have an abortion. And that that's that's sort of what ex what is supposed to explain his view. I, I was I was gonna say that like for me, I, 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 I thought of that, um, like his anti-abortion stance as being like the cherry on top of what I already perceived of him. Because I, I, I read so many little religious at, like moments within the text that I was like, yeah, he, like his, his motives are totally influenced by his religion. Even if he's like not a religious person, I thought that he was totally like, just like controlled by martyrdom or some sort of like, like other being judge judging him at all times and that's kind of why i thought that he uh chose to be homeless and chose to like punish himself i thought of it i thought of himself as being some sort of like cathartic like instrument of re of his religion and he was like punishing himself for being i don't even know for being guilty or something did you like punishment and that didn't make me he really likes punishment. Like e even with like him going and working for effing, I would have quit that job after one day, but he sticks with him until the very fucking end. Like he's, he's all about like sticking through a thing and sticking through an act and sticking through a job. Like even when Barber was like, you know, let's go search for the cave where your where effing's pa uh, paintings could be. He was like, well, my boss could like, like would it would really hurt my boss? And he's like, "You work for a furniture company. Like, what are you talking about? Just fucking quit." And it, it, like it, his his innate sense of being is like, "I'm loyal. I have to stick with the certain. I have to stick with my boss. I have to stick with my god." I think he's. I think he's the, another believable aspect because again, I think MS is pretty thinly drawn, and I uh, I, I think that's intentional in some ways. Uh, when he's called, you know, the ideal listener yep. and all this kind of stuff. I think those are very like intentional tropes being used again. But uh, I think, I think he's a very convincing amount of conflicted in basically everything that he does. Cause what, what about his, uh, his bro? I, I forget Zimmer and stuff. Zimmer. Like, Zimmer. And, and, you know, obviously Kitty and the, and the abortion argument that he has is the biggest, I don't know conflict he has with somebody he ostensibly loves and cares about but you know he, he's he's flip-flopping he's 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 a young man he's uh he's at the cusp of a, a weird time in, in american history which is significant uh i don't know uh, and like so he's at once extremely guilty and 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 ridden with all these inherited i would say uh, senses of shame and whatnot, but but also he like loves Dostoevsky and he's he's a nihilist explicitly and you know wants to die and and I think it, he just ping pongs back and forth uh, between these two or not two necessarily but between these like contradictory untenable uh, positions in his head. I I agree with that. I looked yeah yeah I I I thought that his like his education was more of like a front of how he actually wants to be, but. The religious like the religious aspect of of his being was like always in the forefront i don't know i didn't pick up on that i could just not have been sensitive because 
that seems like the right assessment of some, you know, people from the sixties shrugging off all the, you know, staid moralism of the, of the fifties and, and beyond, you know, before, um, which I think the, the throwbacks into previous time periods and the similarities of the experiences that these people have had from different generational standpoints is supposed to remove that idea that there's any kind of difference generationally or whatnot. You know what I mean? Like that any age is, is really at root different from any other age. Yeah. I mean, so feel me. Yeah, I feel you. I think. (laughs) Okay. So let's, let's address the elephant in the room here, which is that basically in my opinion and uh, Paul, if, if I, I, if you could hold your fire for just a few minutes here, this book is basically existential Forrest Gump. <laughs> and, uh, in, and here's, here's why I'm saying that. In the broadest possible sense, it's the weird life and weird times of some weird guys. And I think that's basically what Forrest Gump is also. And I think that there are, there are some superficial and non-superficial parallels in the sense that this book is is set at roughly the same time that much of Forrest Gump is set, sort of Vietnam War era, hippie movement, um, that sort of thing. Uh, there is a there is a um, very enigmatic, sort of strange, paralyzed character in a wheelchair that the main character <laughs> is tasked with taking care of, who shapes his his worldview in many ways, uh, and who whose death he ultimately sort of oversees and is intimately involved with um and a a big part of the book is about sort of these yeah like these shifting um times of life and these big life events that are intertwined with big shifting historical events uh and of course there you know effing's effing's description of his life his sort of dictating his obituary slash biography to Marco is is filled with these bizarre, over the top, insane, coincidental, and strange stories of him going out to the American Southwest and like living in a cave, painting for months, and interacting with bandits and you know Native American people and uh, all that sort of thing. And and, and I think that you know even at the even right at the end, the book basically ends with. Um, Marco essentially going on a cross country run <laughs> like for his company. He, yes. He's, he's literally hitchhiking to the Pacific ocean. Yep. And um, that's how the book ends. So I do think both thematically and in some, some arguably more or less superficial ways, I'm, I'm saying inter- this is, this is existential Forrest Gump is the, is the best sort of, summation can i can i respond since it's my pick this feels like the debates yeah no, i i, I can mean I respond let me I, I, all i want to say my last thing that i want to say is that this is, <laughs> not, this is not an indictment like forrest gump fucking rules i love forrest gump and i it think- does rule it's just like no i forget who- it does rule someone it's said a, it was it's highlights for baby boomers and i forget who that was but yeah <laughs> I think the biggest, okay, like I understand that there are certain superficial aspects that relate to the, both of these things that are, I, I, you could equate to each other. But I think the biggest thing is like, okay, Afeng was in a wheelchair, Lieutenant Dan was in a wheelchair. But that's not the biggest, the biggest thing. No, 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 it's not. But it, it might be one of the biggest la- like things you could latch on to. Be like, oh, that's Forrest Gump, wheelchair. Mm. It's like, I just, I just <laughs> oh my God. And also like the thing at the end, like, Man. okay, uh, MS, MS walks across the country. It's like the last two pages he like walks r- across the country. It's not like a big aspect of his life. Listen, it, man. It's let, just... me, let me keep going. Let I'm me keep sorry. going. The, okay. So like, but between Lieutenant Dan and Effing, um, I would say that Forrest Gump actually, teaches lieutenant dan more about life than lieutenant dan teaches about uh, about life to forrest gump 
and I think that that's a big difference between MS and effing. Effing doesn't learn anything from from MS other than like you're that's a good not, listener. That is not clear to me. I don't think I I don't think I agree with that. I don't think it's I think that MS became like a good friend to him, but that was basically it. He he respected him for being who he was and speaking his mind and he respected him for sticking with him, but there was nothing that effing learned from MS. All I'm going to say is the original the Forrest Gump was a book and that it came out in in 1986. I don't know. The time lines that up. Uh, Paul Oster, Paul Oster, you're a fraud. You copied the book Forrest Gump. Paul Oster could have that, maybe been clowning on it a bit because it was also a paperback sensation, I believe, when it came yeah. out. But I, I, I think, hmm, yeah, I, I, I think you can't deny. I mean, there's tropes. There's tropes. They're using, they're using certain themes and and imagery and literal events <laughs> that are the same i uh, just want to go on the record as to saying that i i saw nothing if i were to read this book and not have <laughs> gabe and matt talking to me while i was reading it i would have i would have saw zero similarities you were trying to make you see the light baby i think no, I'm, I'm you're you're trying to make me see the darkness of Tom <laughs> Hanks. i mean he is eating babies but I think I think Paul that you're 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 focusing too much on the main character. I'm not saying that Fog and Forrest Gump are similar as characters. They're not. They're very they're very different. But the structure of the story in terms of these, you know, improbable, bizarre historic in some cases historically interrelated and connected events, you know, for example, I mean, even something little like like the guy that um, Fogg speaks to on the phone trying to get some information about his uncle Victor's death is named Neil Armstrong in the year of the moon landing. And yes. that, like, like, so all of these bizarre sort of little mini historical connections that are interwoven with the, the sort of big, you know, shifts in their lives. And this is not just Fogg, this is Effing's story and, and, and um, Barber as well. That's just what that's Forrest Gump, baby. Well, uh, okay. What what I'm trying to say is that like the the claim you're trying to make is sort of like <laughs> what I what I'm hearing is that like you're trying to make it sound like Dances with Wolves influenced Avatar and, and Pocahontas. Like those those three movies are like fucking the same movies. What? You haven't heard that before? No, I mean yes, but I don't know what that has to do with the point I'm making. What I'm saying is that those those similarities are very like you can make an argument for that for sure i am i just make an argument for this it's not even close though like it's not even you just no it's not even close it's not even close (laughs) forrest gump is a gryffindor (laughs) forrest gump is a gryffindor for one thing he's a gryffindor Fog you're, is you're, a doing, you're doing you're doing the you're doing the thing that I just accused you of doing, which is focusing on the main character. I'm not talking about that. Yeah, but you should be because the movie is called Forrest Gump. It's the main character's name. There doesn't have to be a Forrest so. First Gump. of all, there doesn't have to be a Forrest Gump in something for something to be Gumpy in. Right. Well, okay, okay. Even if you're talking about the structure of Forrest Gump as opposed to the structure of this book vastly different <laughs> this 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 book is three different acts forrest gump is like what like seven acts it's it's like it's totally different structure wise I, I i don't see it at all well forrest gump honestly ultimately i mean it, it feels because the, the, gabe you'd brought up coincidences which is another thing that i think oster is actively yes dealing with as something that's stupid and silly and you know like innately unbelievable every time and so as a writer you try and avoid such a thing and the reality of them as a thing that occurs and and you know this is this is something that writers have been struggling with probably in storytelling all the time uh oh my god i fucking lost my train of thought well, and, and, oh, but, oh. If, if, yeah go ahead go ahead i was just gonna say like you know, Forrest Gump, he's almost like being there. He's like a, a simpleton that, I don't know, he almost like, he has a dignity and whatnot. But like, in in this book, 
there there was a line that I tried to remember before, and it was something about uh, uh, like Fog when he was feverish and and homeless started to describe his life as literally a joke answer that I think Gabe gave about something in one of the our previous episodes where he was just like, I love it's a my it's about events happening in a sequence. <laughs> right. <laughs> like, it's just it he boil at some point he just boils it down to like the literal essentials of just events happening in a context in uh order, a particular order. And I think I mean one of the other things that further supports that, Matt, I think, is that the, the the coincidence and sort of random events occurring uh, in, in ways that we generate meaning from is an explicit theme in this book that's talked about right. a number of times, um, and which is also a very explicit theme in Forrest Gump, uh, yes. with, with Forrest Gump meeting and interacting with all of these people at precisely the right moment and precisely the right thing happening. So, you know, I mean, effing, Effing has this all, whole whole sort of vague theory of everything about the universe. He doesn't believe in coincidences, and they talk about that multiple times. Um, and then right at the end, towards the end, when uh, uh, he first meets Barber, I'll just read this. This is when it's sort of uh, is first hinted at that um, Fogg's mother is the the student that Barber had sex with. Um, so this is. Uh, Barber talking now. I once knew someone by the name of Fogg, he said at last, a long time ago. It's not the most common name, I said, but there are a few of us around. This Fogg was a student of mine back in the 40s. I had only just started teaching then. Do you remember his first name? I remember, yes, but it wasn't a man. It was a young woman, Emily Fogg. She was a freshman in my American history class. Do you know where she was from? Chicago. I think it was Chicago. My mother's name was Emily and she came from Chicago. Could there have been two Emily Foggs in the same city at the same college? It's possible, but I don't think it's very likely. The resemblance is too strong. I recognized her the moment you walked into the room. One coincidence after another, I said, the universe seems to be filled with them. If that's not a Forrest Gump line, I don't know what is. Yeah, I, the one concession I'll give to Paul that like is the huge difference is more an emphasis rather than a total change and it's or like absence, which is that I think coincidence is dealt with cheekily and cautious you know cautiously here as maybe evidence of a kind of unified theory of everything or or some kind of you know interwoven i don't know reality whereas gump just revels in the delight of you know a retarded guy being meeting president nixon right and like inventing shit happens <laughs> phrase Right. <laughs> stuff like yeah, that. I mean, it's like whimsical and just like sort of having fun with that idea. Right. Yeah, I just didn't. I I don't think I grasp onto that idea to that like wholeheartedly. I guess I, I mean, I kind I do kind of see it, but I, I'm still just have I'm I'm struggling with it just because like the differences are are greater than the connections to me. So here's another it's sort like, of trite freight uh little passage that felt <laughs> comfy <in laughs> to me what page is this on the pdf map i got i'm physical copy gang right oh, now oh damn okay yeah uh you you fucking guys paul oster is a genius i i'm not gonna i'm not leveling any sort of judgment on him as a writer uh by one book alone i uh, do want to talk about his. we haven't talked about his writing style i do want to talk about that too okay i just want to read Go this ahead. one passage uh, it's kind of adjacent to what Gabe was talking about. Uh, this is effing, I think, having kind of a stonery revelation uh, where he says, if you think about it long enough, it will turn your brain inside out. A here exists only in relation to a there, not the other way around. There's this, o there's this only because there's that. If we don't look up, we'll never know what's down. Think of it, boy. We find ourselves only by looking at what we're not. You can't put your feet on the ground until you've touched the sky. Jenny, which Je Jenny, <laughs> <laughs> and that's Jenny. <laughs> well, no, you know it, it's for an eighty whatever year old man. Effing was seems like you know I don't know. He's getting excited. He's on meds at that point. If he's Loves getting it. that excited about that. 
Oh yeah. But at the same time, contains the profound truth. But you know, it's it's so profound that it's eye rolling. Right. I, I suppose. And Paul did it. Paul actually rolled his eyes, and he sucked on his jewel. Paul. Paul. Paul has entered his his alternative uh, identity, which is not Paul, not Paulie, but salty. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not salty. I just I, I I really enjoyed this book, and I get the sense that you guys didn't enjoy it. I I really liked it a lot. I, I don't know where I you mean, get that. I'm just talking about Forrest Gump, man. Yeah, yeah. I mean, Forrest Gump is a a dipshit movie. Dipshit. <laughs> you just said you loved it. <laughs> You're letting I, us. I, I do. I do. I love it in the way that I love like Independence Day. You know, <laughs> I, I, I would. I would. Not I even close. I think of Paul Oster as being a, a little bit above Independence Day, like light years above. I mean, I I think in the last book we read, the the Divinity Student, we talked like there were. Um, I I listened to an inter- or I read an interview where the guy like the author said that he's interested in writing in a, in a way that like basically hypnotizes the the reader, and that's what he likes about about writing. And that's what he likes about reading. And I thought, I think that Paul Oster does that for me. Like I thoroughly enjoy just re- like the act of reading when I'm reading his books. I, I, I love the act of reading just as him being a writer. I think he's an uh, amazing writer. I read his books and I'm just like enthralled and I read everything very, very quickly. And I think that's, partially what he's going for too like he wants to create interesting characters above almost anything else he wants you to be enthralled in the characterization and that's one thing i really like about reading in general I, i like interesting characters so that's one thing that i took away from this book in particular i thought every character was immensely interesting and i i thought that they're the amount of like screen time they got was awesome like it's like you get you get lore from every for every character you get tons of lore like there's there's one page i highlighted (laughs) where effing is 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 a drinking soup and it's disgusting he's an old man yeah in his 80s drinking soup and he drinks it like so loudly and he just doesn't give a shit. He's just like, I'm gonna drink the soup, and I'm, I'm gonna be nasty because I don't give a shit. Like, only MS is around me, and my servant woman is around me. I'm gonna eat the soup the way that I want. And the way that it's Should described, I, I, I do an extended reading of that passage. I have it. Yeah, read it. Yeah, it's like a whole page. Do right? it. Yeah. All right. So, um, uh. This is, he's, yeah, so he's describing their, their, their usual meal. Effing didn't eat much, but the little he did eat was consumed in a mad free-for-all of slobbering grunts and spills. It disgusted me to watch this spectacle, but I had no choice but to endure it. Whenever Effing sensed that I was staring at him, he would immediately bring out an even more repulsive battery of tricks, letting the food dribble out of his mouth and down his chin, burping, feigning nausea and heart attacks, removing his false teeth and putting them on the table. (laughs) He was especially fond of soups, and all during the winter, we began every meal with a different one. Mrs. Hume, who's the, the sort of like physical caretaker of Effing, made these soups herself, delicious pots of vegetable soup and watercress soup and leek and potato soup. But I quickly came to dread the moment when I would have to sit down and watch Effing suck suck it into his mouth. It was not it was not that he slurped. He positively vacuumed it up, piercing the air with all the clamor and commotion of a defective Hoover. This noise was so unnerving, so distinctive that I began hearing it all the time, even when we were not sitting at the table. <laughs> even now, if I manage to concentrate hard enough, I can bring it back in so many of its subtle characteristics. The shock of the first moment when Effing's lips met the spoon, the shattering, the quiet with a monumental intake of breath, the prolonged high-pitched ruckus that followed, a blistering uproar that seemed to turn the liquid into a concoction of gravel and broken glass as it traveled down his throat. <laughs> <laughs> the second so good. The yeah, that shit's good. The short pause that came next, the clank of the spoon as it hit the bowl, and then the heave and shudder of an outward breath. 
He would smack his lips at that point, perhaps even grimace with pleasure, and then begin the process all over again, filling the spoon and lifting it to his mouth, always with his head hunched forward to shorten the journey between bowl and mouth, but nonetheless with a shaking hand, which would send small streams of soup splattering back into the bowl as the spoon neared his lips. And then there would be a new explosion, a new splitting of the ears as the suction was turned on again. Mercifully, he rarely <laughs> finished an entire bowl of the stuff. Three or four of these cacophonous spoonfuls were generally enough to exhaust him, after which he would shove the bowl aside and calmly ask Mrs. Hume what she had prepared. I don't know how many times I heard this noise, but often enough to know that it will never leave me, and I will be carrying it around in my head for the rest of my life. That's one of the best passages. I mean, it's so good. Again, Paul, you so seem good. to insinuate that we, we didn't enjoy ourselves, but there are moments like that where I laughed reading that and I just laughed again. And he's clearly a phenomenal writer. So, yeah. Well, I, I think that what I like about him most is that, like, he gives characters lore in the past. <laughs> like, well, I was about to say, this isn't lore based. This is his descriptive abilities of this moment that's hilarious are hilarious but it has nothing yeah, I, guess, to do. I guess i guess it has, it, i guess it's not lower base but it's like this overabundance of physical characterization is what i really like about paul oster's writing is like his characters to me like i could see them in the fucking room like barber to me i i love that character just like this immensely fat man who eats himself to death and went bald and wears a bunch of hats, but is also like a very prominent, like literary man who like, I don't know. I, I, I want to know this guy and I, and even fog, like I would be friends with fog. Like, even though he, like, I don't like him. You're, you're reading like the most immensely passionate readings of this guy's life and they're forgivable but they're also like fuck you dude you're an asshole I, I think, um, well i do agree with matt that fog i think is as a character it's it's a strange phenomenon because we see the whole thing through his perspective but he is still sort of this cipher who can't who cannot make sense of himself and therefore we can't really make sense of him in a lot of ways um, I definitely, I agree with you that the other characters, uh, Barber and, and Effing, who Effing, I basically see as a, a, a hybrid of Lieutenant Dan and Dr. Finkelstein from A Nightmare Before Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. Sally. Sally. That's great. <laughs> I mean, let's, let's, I mean, literally the soup description, the guy loves soup. Yes. So he literally, uh, Paul Oster is a complete sham and stole Nightmare Before Christmas and Forrest Gump. And frog's <laughs> breath. Frog's breath. There's nothing frog's more breath. suspicious than well, frog's uh, breath. I tell you. Well, I think that I like what. That spoon ball. <laughs> 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 Fucking great movie. Uh, anyway, the point I was making was that I think these, these, other, these other characters, you're right, Paul, they're much more vividly. Um, outlined. They're much more vividly described both physically and sort of like their behavior. Uh, and I think, you know... Fog, Every single one. I, I don't think Fog is. Nor Kitty would... No, I think... No, I think Kitty is pretty... I think Kitty is pretty... <laughs> like, maybe she... she. <laughs> I think Kitty I is pretty. Yeah, she's pretty. No, I think out of all the characters, Kitty and Fog are probably like the least described, but I still get a big sense of who they are from reading the novel i don't know i, I... for me it was it was uh i i didn't I'm, I'm criticizing the thing i overall thought it was a little weak just because i i found i i i think i get what the uh some of the attempts were in terms of the themes and i it just felt a little like paced a little awkwardly you know you, you you it's like uh the form is doing its function or whatever but in a way that's bad where again i'll just go back to the thing things happening to people in a sequence it, it, but it really started to feel that way during some of the like especially like effing's uh obit kind of dictation um 
it, it just dragged a little bit. As yeah, far as I, was I definitely, I agree. I definitely found chunks of both that section where effing is dictating his, his, his life and his, yeah, his obituary, his biography, whatever we're calling it. And the section where we get essentially a, a, a complete play-by-play -play of um, Barber's like attempted novel. I found both that drag. I found both of those sections to be like pretty tedious at points, and I found myself like checking ahead multiple times, like how much longer is this going on? And I think yeah. there's supposed to I be mean, narratives that you know you. It's supposed to be overtly a narrative because right. again, I think this is very much about you got this cipherish kind of thinly you know drawn kind of you know overeducated hyper reader who essentially read a library alone in an apartment now being the quote unquote perfect listener to these other narratives who are also like literally part of his genetic lineage and all these kind of things resonating with each other see i, I thought that the only time I, I was like oh this is dragging was when he was given the pl the play by play of barber's novel i was like what the this is taking a long time but I was enthralled the whole time I was reading Effin's uh, obituary section. I thought that was awesome. Well, here's, um, here's what it was for me with the obituary section. It wasn't that the content was uninteresting. It was, and I would have been thrilled to read that as like a <laughs> short novella or something, honestly. But it was this conscious feeling of like, the rest of this book is being eaten up page by page by this description. And I don't necessarily see why. And I still don't. Well, that's what I, I think that that, yeah, you know, that, that partakes with the New York trilogy too. Like the, the New York trilogy is a three, it was a three novella book. Like, and I almost think of this book as being the same way. Like I think of the, the three sections as being very different than each other like you, you almost like stop and start three times well they are but it's not um, i mean it's not an it's not the new york trilogy it's a continuous story with one with the same character no but i read it i read it as the same way maybe it's because i've read the new york trilogy before and i had that in mind when i read it but like i kind of got what especially by the third act i got what he was doing more like, it was just like okay there are three different stories happening in this in this book and there's a lot of stopping and starting and i'm okay with that um i guess i was just most emotionally invested in ms because the beginning was probably my favorite part except for incidental descriptions of barber or things like effing eating soup where i was like okay well this is a little this is color and and this is like showcasing things that i i wish would be more consistently in the book um, and, and, but I, I was still more interested in like MS and his plight and where he was landing. Cause he seemed like such a, you know, I, I, obviously Auster is writing from probably the reason that character is so vivid and cringe inducing for me early on is cause you know, he, he's probably very similarly educated and has similar predilections of, of reading and all that kind of stuff, which is why that character, I don't know. I agree. I mean, I think so. Well, I think my, my favorite parts in the book, you know, I found, you know, for example, the ending where he's standing on the shores of, of the Pacific Ocean and and even, you know, a lot of the stuff leading up to it, like his fight with his fight with Kitty. I found that stuff to be genuinely emotionally affecting and actually like really well done. Um, yeah. And so like having that experience, I'm kind of like, I, I just wish that that was more of the story rather than this literally like i mean it's it's literally like probably 80 pages of effings you know dictating his obituary and i was like I, it, 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 was, it was just a little bit of a disconnect to me because i felt like so much of the stuff that was done really well had to do with ms directly and his own feelings and his own experiences with his friends with kitty um and i kind of wanted more of that And aside from, you know, Barber and Barber and Effing, obviously, again, it's like multi-generational grandfather, father, son, inherited narratives, et cetera. 
the 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 scintillating feeling of just coincidences occurring across time and all this kind of stuff it mostly just felt like, like examples of how narratives repeat and how they can both be a little bit like cliche while still being true or something like that you know and so when you have somebody like i mean it's a 300 page book and and you have some you have effing's portion being uh you know 80 pages yeah it, it just it just felt a little bit like gut like the gut was sagging in the middle of the thing experientially for me as well yep i think i think that i I was okay with any sagging notions because <laughs> I think that uh, Paul Oster for me, I, I just love his writing so much. It's so clear and concise. It's like, it's how I like to read. And I think that one thing that our book club has taught me in the last however months is that like, one thing I like about reading is just, I like reading clear, concise writing. I, I, that's like really valuable to me as a reader that's interesting and i i think it's totally true like i i actually think that paul oster resonates with me the same way that murakami re re resonates with me i i like to be kind of drawn into like a hypnotic state when i read it's enjoyable for me and maybe that's like I don't know. I, I, mean, think I guess I'm, I, I mean, maybe we don't need to get into this too deeply, but like, it's interesting that I, I guess I just don't really those those things all sound different to me. Like part like part of me and Matt's what we're saying is precisely that it was not concise. <laughs> that it was like it, 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 he's, yeah, he's a clear writer, and it's not like but but he also he's also very kind of like I find Paul Oster to be very sort of esoteric and arcane and he, he always bring, he brings in all these weird references and these references to these old obscure historical figures and books and concepts and i'm not saying that it's unclear for that reason but it's i i, I guess i wouldn't it's not like hemingway or somebody when it's where it's these like very like precise sharp sentences that just get across the the the, the point or, or get across what's happening it's not that at all, and and I think I find it interesting that that's your experience of reading it, and I also just well, don't I think, think like the 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 sort of hypnotic trance state or whatever. That's not something that I associate with like concision either. That's something that I associate with this sort of like long kind of winding stuff of of like Cisco or like Krasna Horkai. Yeah. yeah. Yes. See, for me, I don't. I didn't have that feeling at all reading those books at all. It was like a it was a drag for me to read that. I, I think that what I'm saying is that like, even if like the overall like structure- liking, You're not liking a book at some level, I guess. That's not fair. That's not fair. I, I, what, what I'm saying is that like the overall sentence structure and paragraph structure that Paul Oster uses, I really, really like. Like when, I, when I'm just reading a chapter of his, I get enthralled with the way he writes. And maybe there are certain aspects of the overall structure of the whole story that I don't totally understand or maybe disagree with. Like, I, I think that overall, the, the three lineage structure that he did, I think it's kind of ham-fisted. I think that the, the, the coincidences are kind of like, they're too much for me. Like, this whole story focused around a grandson, a father, and a, and a, and a grandfather. And it at the end, when I realized that they were all interconnected, I was like, this is too much of a coincidence for me, like as an overall telling of a story. But that doesn't mean that when I was reading it in the act of reading, I was totally enthralled by the way he writes sentences and paragraphs. Like that's what I really, really like about how he writes. So yeah, I mean, I, I don't, I, I do think that it, it is ham fisted. I kept coming back to the word when I was reading it. It's like, oh, especially when it gets to like the last hundred pages with Barber and it's his father. I'm like, all right, this is like a little too many coincidences for me. But still, I really, really enjoy the way he writes. And I think that like if we're if we're being in a book club and talking about books, I think that is something we should talk about is like 
how how a writer actually writes what he's saying is important to the reader. Yeah. And that that can that can go a long way for anybody. Like you can agree with with the idea of a book or like the philosophy of a book, but if it's not written in a way that you find appealing, that's not enjoyable, it can really like be a lot worse in your rating or whatever. That's what isn't that what we're talking about right now, baby? Yeah, I was about to say this is like what I think one of the themes of the book of Moon Palace is as well, which is why I think you get the semi like you know the semi truthful autobiography dictated by an old man looking back groggily a bit on his right. life versus the fantastic child you know sort of childhood fantasy tale pulp magazine kind of story that Barbara writes about a fictional self finding a fictional father and literally incorporating a creation myth about moon people into it. Uh, I think the notion of what constitutes something that's entertaining versus uh, how, how, you know, I guess at this point in, in right, you know, in history of the sixties, like how genre convention and uh, co coincidental turns and all this kind of stuff that you are used to move plot along can either remove or engage you. And uh, I think that is one of the central tensions. I just don't, and, and I like those themes and questioning them. I just happen to think that in this book, the only book of Paul Auster's I've ever read, uh, I, I think he just fumbles a bit for me personally. I don't know if I I don't know. I, I see your connections to Murakami of superficially just because this is the only book of Paul Ashers I read, just because he also does this kind of you know, you you delve you delve into you start off at a, a singular point with a character who's kind of like uh very barely described. There's a lot of like book and musical references and things sort of slowly elaborate into something much more Baroque and oftentimes fantastical by the end of it. Um, but yeah, I don't know. I, it's not a knock on his style or ability to write so much as just this, in this particular case, I don't know, holistically, like the book didn't work and that affects my overall opinion about the experience, I guess. Yeah, I think it's, that's totally fair. I think that I'm giving him more of the benefit of the doubt because I've read other books and they worked a lot more as a whole overall structure for me. Um. This one, I think, did fall flat in a lot of ways. But I still ho hold it on, as a pretty high level, at a pretty high level, because I think that his writing is just so great for me as a reader. I just, I just like, I connect with it. Like, it, it almost feels like, a, like I'm reading it, and it's like, it feels like music to me. I feel like that sounds like I put, like, gems on my my chest when i go to sleep or something but <laughs> the, the rhythm of his writing just like really connects with me like I, it's I like poetry I, it rhymes it's like poetry it rhymes Full circle yeah. baby we did and we did it were there any um other specific passages or anything you guys wanted to hit on or or jump out to you i don't know i it was pretty like i said it was pretty front loaded for me i'm trying to think I loved, I mean, that soup thing was definitely a big one for me as yeah, well. I was just thinking of, uh, you know, uh, that movie Mafia? Yes. <laughs> you know, uh, when, <coughs> sorry, Jay Moore's character is like all burned and in a wheelchair at the funeral and he's being fed pre-chewed canned peaches and he's like <laughs> they're like slithering into his burned oh, shitty mouth <laughs> like i was just seeing that let's see what the fuck else do i got here? i think uh i mean okay so this is what i was sort of talking about when i was mentioning auster's sort of ar arcane arcanicism i don't know if that's a word but sure uh this is when sort of um in the in the sort of uh 
salad days with with ms and kitty after they get um effing's money when he dies and they're sort of mac demarco what no, I just, oh sorry, my I god, Mac DeMarco. His name is Marco. <laughs> Salad days. Salad days. I was just saying. Anyway. What a coincidence. Did Paul also wow. write this dialogue? Uh, did, he write all of, <laughs> did he write all of Salad Days? Is he the uh, actual author of He's the, the uh, ghostwriter. Mac DeMarco's never wrote a fucking song in his life. <laughs> Someone check the Mary's <laughs> credits. Um, but this is this is sort of what I was talking about. He's writing all these essays, you know. Uh, and and sort of just exploring sort of his thought or whatever. I can't remember all the pieces I worked on, but at least several of them come back to me when I strain hard enough. A meditation on money, for example, and another one on clothes, an essay on orphans and a somewhat longer piece on suicide, which of course is one of the themes of the book, which was largely a discussion of Jacques Rigaud, a minor French Dadaist who declared at the age of 19 that he was giving himself 10 more years to live. And then when he turned 29, held good to his word and shot himself on the appointed day. That's basically what Effing did. That's basically how Effing died. He said, I'm dying yeah. on March 12th of this year, whatever the date it was that he picked. And then he went out in the rain and got sick and then died on that day. And um, I just think that, that there's those sort of like weird, esoteric, arcane connections that are that are in there. I mean, and then, you know, again, sort of like Forrest Gump, there's the like he met like Tesla, and then there's this biography yep. of Tesla that's involved and uh, you know, uh, all of these big historical figures that he sort of coincidentally sort of um, crosses their path with. And then it also comes back that a fortune cookie that MS opened had a saying that was originally written by Tesla when he was like, you know, so right. it's all of these like funny, we, you know, uh, maybe overdone kind of, like you said, Paul, coincidences. But uh, I think that's, well, there's, there's I think it's intentional and and sort of, um yeah well yeah it totally is intentional there's a, there's a quote that i have underlined from um when ms was talking about how victor could have seen uh barber in yes. st paul minnesota and he says we're at the world's fair that he, he yeah he t he tells ms that like he saw like a really huge fat guy eating somewhere in minnesota maybe at the i forget where it was but he says like when he when he saw this guy he said anyone who eats like that is trying to kill himself he said to me it's the same thing as watching a man starve to death mm. and i was like that's an obvious parallel between like you know obviously barber doing the extreme opposite end of what ms did yep and i like that connection is like ms in the beginning is just starving himself to death he ends up being like 120 pounds by the time he gets like re like re revived by kitty goals and zimmer but <laughs> inspiration barber but barber does the opposite yeah barber does the opposite he's more just like i'm giving up on life and i'm just going to keep doing what i'm doing and i'm going to eat myself until i'm fat and bald but it's both for the same reason ultimately right which is that they're just giving up and saying fuck it i'm just going to do the do the, do what i'm doing until i die yeah, I think there's some difference though. Like I still think Barber kind of like he was doing it for like similar reasons, but also like the reasonings that that he chose were a little more I don't know, they're not positive, but they're a little bit more like agreeable than the the reasons that MS MS did them. He like he was still living a life, he was still like I'm going to keep doing what I'm doing. I'm going to do what I wanted to do as be a professor. I'm not going to like have sex with, with a, one of my students ever again. And I'm becoming my own self by being like this fat guy who wears hats. And I'm like, I'm my own He's man just now. like Lizzo I, I or something? Of, like, he's just <laughs> like... <laughs> I think you're fat shaming him, to be honest. I think I, Paul I Oster's know. fat shaming him. Yeah. No, I don't think he is. I think that there are aspects of what Cancel. Oster was doing. I don't think he was. I don't think he was fat shaming at all. I think that he he like gave credit where credit was due. I I don't think he was shaming him at all. I think he I think he was saying that he came into his own, and yeah, he was a mega fat man, 
but he was okay with it. He was okay right. with it. And like, who are you to judge? Like, yeah, it's like killing him, but he was actually more acceptable of himself and he was happier. Even though I, he was lonely, I think that he was happy. I think you're really underplaying the death drive that I think is like pretty clear in all three people, yep. unfortunately. Like, and I, I, you do get the, I mean, again, this is, I'm not fat shaming. I'm not that guy. I don't do that. Okay, he dies of obesity-related complications after an in, an injury that he incurs at the end of the book that he could have survived from had he not been doing the things he had been doing over the course of his whole life. Yeah, it sounds like that you want him, you wish he would go work I, out. I wish he was alive because I loved him as a character, actually, Paul. So yeah. no, I don't know. I I think that I I don't think there is any. I don't think Paul Oster was like, this I guy mean, is okay failing but, as a human because he's fat. And no, he's, that's he's that's not that, that's not what's that, that's not what I don't think that that's at issue at all. Well, the fact of the matter is that Barber's entire life is structured around the fact that he lost Emily and that he fucked up that relationship and that he's never going to see her again, and that his life is essentially ruined at that point. This is why he's at the grave. This is why he's crying. When he when he's there and Emily's dead is because that was his that was his whole sort of you know life uh, uh, plan and it it's it doesn't work it's impossible and it was he was twenty nine years old when he fucked Emily right she was nineteen he's what fifty plus years old now and that's the only it's thing morbid and weird about yeah that's not that's not happy that's very very sad it's fixated and yeah pathological. I, I think I read it as him being like okay with his sadness, and that connects with me a little bit. Well, yeah, I mean, there, there's some level of acceptance. They talk about, you know, he knew he would never see her again, and then when he found out he was dead, it was just sort of confirming something he already knew. But I don't know. Acceptance is not the same as like happiness. <laughs> yeah. No. There's no, resignation, is. which is what it feels like more for everybody. Yeah, you know? but I. I I almost feel like there's a certain point in your life where you, you are like you you accept that resignation and I feel like that's what he like where he was at he was he was just like accepting of of himself and he was he like he formed some sort of reality that was like accept, acceptable to him and he went with it and he lived a, like a pretty good life for a number of years. I don't know. Is it is it is it time? Can I just say one more th I just wanted to throw out one more thing, just a okay. little n idea and then it will be time. Uh but I I I thought it would just be important to say the phrase that I think the forge cookie said on it, which is that what the sun the sun is the past, the earth is the present, and the moon is the future. Right. I mean, the book's called Moon Palace. There's a lot of moon imagery. We didn't really talk about it at all. Uh, I'm not sure what to make of it anyway. Um, but I think that little phrase is supposed to be, which is, I, and I love anything with the World's Fair, and I love looking at the past uh, projections of the future are always super funny and fascinating and really interesting. And that's like what the World's Fair kind of was, like, America feeling itself and its technological progress marching forward and Tesla as like the central image, like character that I, I feel like effing most vibed with until he didn't anymore. Right. was just like, you know, even this great prognosticator of the future, genius, wizard, potential alien, you know, according to some, uh, was just a doddering old man who was fucked over by <laughs> like Edison yes. and just like insane uh, by the end of his life. And he like saw him contemptuously as well. And just, so, and then you have these repetitions through multiple generations. I, I mean, I think, I think you're getting a bit of the darker side of Paul Oster's notion of, of the world and people's potential uh, in stuff like that. Yeah. And I, we probably should at least mention, I mean, I think, Right, like that, the phrase that's on the fortune cookie about the sun and the moon and the earth. Is that what it is? Earth, whatever. Yeah. That's, you know, 
pretty 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 uh, 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 directly maps onto the three generations, right? The men that we that we see in the story, um, and maybe we should just say where the phrase "Moon Palace" comes from. It's it's a it's a neon sign that he sees one night from his apartment uh, as he's sort of slowly starving to death at the beginning, and it's a it's a Chinese restaurant. Um, and that's where he goes and, and gets the fortune cookie that has that phrase. Is I moon do... face wrong to bring to bring up? Huh? Is the sort of slur moon face wrong to bring up? I don't know. I mean, I, n- he has a Chinese girlfriend. I just, I don't know, man. It's the sixties. I don't know. Yeah. I, I actually don't, I'm not really familiar with that term. Fuck. All right. Well, glad I outed myself there. <laughs> Harry Potter. <laughs> Harry oh, Potter. I do, yeah, I agree with you, Matt. I'm not exactly sure what to make out of the, all the moon stuff other than that sort of tri-generational thing with the fortune cookie. Um, yeah. And they just sort of, yeah. There is a lot of moon imagery and there's a lot of sort of, there's a lot of palace imagery in the sense that like, you know, he, lo- he lives in a cave, Effing lives in a cave and they make it into their own sort of like, mm-hmm you know places where they feel happy there are little fortresses and there's a description of barber having that sort of relationship to his own body as well so right. um his think, head's I, a moon yeah that could be something also anyway it just seems like there's so much of that and we have so little to say <laughs> about it I feel kind of I, mean, bad. I didn't feel like it was like overwhelming like i didn't you know i feel like it was a a couple i don't know yeah okay I mean, I'm not sweating it. Let's move on. Uh, so it's that means you know what that means. It's time for everyone's favorite segment. We literally just read another book. Copyright strike. <laughs> In- no, you can hum it. In which we assign characters from the book that we just read to their respective Harry Potter houses because that is an effective and intelligent way to interpret literature. It, it, totally. I refuse to move beyond uh, that kind of rubric. And I think we already got a sneak peek, folks. I know you guys got excited <laughs> when you heard it early on. But Paul, who's MS? Where is he, where is he getting sorted to? He's fucking Cedric Diggory level Hufflepuff. <laughs> Are you kidding me? Like no doubt, right? Agreed. Yeah, the the guy's a Hufflepuff, no question. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, like like a like the strongest Hufflepuff you can be. That like he's got I'm tinges of evil in pos- Hufflepuff in him. Yeah. Yeah, but you can rape and be Hufflepuff though. <laughs> As we say. I forgot, dude. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, okay, wait a second. Hold on. Hold on. Is he Hufflepuff? Whoa. Hold yeah. On. Is he, he is, I mean, it's not clear to me that he's a particularly loyal or good friend. He just kind of lets people flow in and out of his life, basically. Like, there's a number of times where he's like, yeah, I said I would see, see this person again, including his best friend Zimmer. And then he's like, and of course, I never did for 20 years. Yeah, Zimmer gets short shrift. Yeah, and that happens a, a couple other times too. Um, yeah, but I think that loyalty doesn't have to just re- like relate to friendships. It can relate to just like how you act as a human. And he's so loyal to Effing. And then again, he's like so loyal to... Uh, I think the biggest aspect is that he's loyal to uh, the furniture moving company when he when he should be doing this thing, like looking for the cave where his grandfather's parents are. He's just like, I think I need to stay at my job and just like do my job. I don't know. I just, I found him to be loyal. Like that was like his number one attribute is just like, I'm loyal. And like, I'm going to read all of my uncle Victor's book. Yeah, that's true. To him. Even though he's fucking like, even though he's fucking dead, like who gives a <laughs> shit? Yeah. Like, no, it's true. Don't read his books. I guess I just would, would, would push back a little bit in the sense that if I don't think he does all of those things, like I don't think he stays with effing out of a sense of loyalty to effing it's out of a sense of like self-flagellating punishment for himself and or like trying to prove to himself that he can do something 
I don't think it's loyalty. I think it's more related to him than it is to the other person. Ravenclaw? Um, isn't that more? Isn't that still? Isn't that still Hufflepuff though? I don't know. I'm like, with you. It reminds Paul. I think me it's of Hufflepuff, but I think it's like like a soldier who's like, I need to survive boot camp because I need to do this because it's like, like hard and it'll like prove something to me and to the gods. I yeah, think now you're talking about the, like, the motivation think, for the loyalty. Which yeah, is I think ultimately question. he is still Hufflepuff, but I, I, I just thought it was important to flag that. You're um, right. It wasn't as cut and dry as we made it seem. Yeah. All right. I'm so sorry, I'm eating. About um, how about uh, Kitty Wu? Gryffindor. Griffin, Gryffindor. No, yeah. no. Kitty Wu is good Hufflepuff. Kitty, oh. Wu, Kitty Wu is just classic Hufflepuff. She she literally meets this guy one time and she feels worried for him and tracks him down at his apartment to go like help him. You know what? You're right. You're right. You're right. Yeah, you're right. And then and she like, literally like finds, be with like. she really tracks down his friend and they go find him when he's homeless in the park. Very lo- loyal, very good friend, very Hufflepuff. And then she has like a five-year relationship with him. Yes. I don't know if it was that yeah. long, but. How about uh, Thomas? Effing. Z- yeah. Effing is a Slytherin. Hmm. I'm actually he does what some genuine thought. He does he does what he wants for himself. He he cheats on his wife and then he leaves and like goes on a self-inflicted like I want to know about the world for myself. He fakes his own and death. And then I'm gonna, I'm going to fake my own death so that I can have an easier time of living for myself. And then he murders three people. They were they were not gonna... to say they were going to murder him, but he could have just left. But he chose to stay for like seven months and wait for them, so that yeah. he could murder them and like stay in his cave. Yeah, for sure. And then when he keeps he's the also money, when he keeps the money, he's very explicit. Like I never I even thought it. about trying to give it yeah. back. Yeah, yeah. I mean, he does have like positive attributes. Like he's like, I'm gonna. Uh, the last act he has in his life is like, I'm gonna give strangers the twenty thousand right. dollars that I stole or whatever. That's true. He yeah, but give it back in the at the end. But Snape is also a Slytherin. He has a big heart, so he's a like effing very true. Slytherins As the same have big hearts. Yes. Yeah. Exactly. Okay, let's talk about Solomon Barber. I feel like he is a Hufflepuff. <sighs> I'm, mm, I'm thinking Ravenclaw. I know, I know. I've, I'm, I, that's my initial reaction, but I'm like, is it is it just because he's a college professor that I'm thinking that? Maybe, but is it just because he's fat? <laughs> he's awful. <fun. laughs> well, I mean, M- MS talks about his, like what he thinks his motivations are for his studies towards the end, and he says that they're like self inflicted because of his past, and that makes him more Hufflepuff to me. Like he's trying to like. He's doing it for himself and trying to like reason with with his existence, and it's he, it, it's not a it's not a pursuit of of studying because he loves studying. It's it's a pursuit yeah. of studying because he has this like this weird Hufflepuff motivation in his mind. And he he never got over a girl he had sex with once for thirty years. So he's that's a, actually yeah. that's super Hufflepuff. That 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 yeah. fucking pounds the gavel. He's a Hufflepuff. yeah Hufflepuff baby. Um, is there anyone else? Uncle Victor? I think Uncle Victor is uh Gryffindor? Gryffindor? Oh, Gryffindor. Okay. He's I think not he, enough of I an think he's a Chad. Yeah, I thought he was more of like a like in a brave way pursuing what he wanted to do. Yes. As opposed to like most of the other characters in this book. Yeah. Okay. That's what about Mrs. Hume? Mrs. Hume. Hufflepuff. 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 Yep. This is a Hufflepuff ass book. <laughs> yeah, it's 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 Hufflepuff heavy. What about Zimmer? <laughs> I don't know if we know enough about Zimmer, honestly. He seems I, Ravenclaw, I but whatever. Ravenclaw. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's basically it. it. I think that's yeah. pretty much it. Um so there it is. We just read another book. 
And uh, let's give it, should we give it some, some, some ratings, some scores? All right, boys. Anyone got one right out the chamber? I'm at a, I'm at a 2.9. Oh my God. That's why I was going to go three even. I gave it a 4.4. All righty. Widely divergent. I like that. My, That's my favorite kind my, of thing. Though. My, I'm not, I'm not happy about this because all of, all of your lowest ratings have been my books. It sucks. I think it's evened out by how much you hated Humesville. <laughs> yeah, that was your entire time of discussion. That was the first time I've ever wrote an essay to just open this <laughs> how much you hated it. That book sucks so bad. <laughs> I'll take that in stride. Listen, I'll take that in stride. I'll yeah. argue it down, but no, it's it's it, you know, it ain't personal, baby. Um all right, fine. Any final thoughts before we say goodbye to the people? Uh, no. Uh, you know, it's a crazy world out there. <laughs> There's a lot going on. It's uh, things are happening. You, if you get the constant, remember, if you things events are occurring in time. Right. Uh, if you get the Constitution, you are the leader of the the country for as long as you can hold it. It's like capture the flag right now, out there. Yes. Uh, so just have at it, I guess. Go grab it and yell something. Say yell orders to the world. That's right. Yeah. Manifest it. Purge world. Right. Purge That's world another thing. theme too. Manifest destiny. Okay. Bye. All right. Bye. Bye. All right, Paul.